Good morning, everybody. I'm Melanie Cohen. Welcome to the HUD OCIO Learning Session. I uh, want to welcome those who are here in the room with us today and welcome all of those who are watching on the internet. Uh, we're varying a little bit from our usual monthly discussion where we usually talk about management, leadership, organizational behavior, organizational culture. And today what we're talking about is climate change adaptation. And we're really very fortunate to have with us Dr. Chester Koblinski from NOAA. Um, you have his bio. What I will mention to you is he sent a very, very modest bio. So let me tell you three other things about him as I introduce him to you, because I want you to understand exactly how distinguished he is. Uh, first, he's a recipient of the Presidential Rank Award for Federal, for federal Senior Executives. He also is a recipient of NASA's Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement, and he has also published numerous scientific papers, primarily on ocean circulation and monitoring. So with that, let me introduce to you from NOAA, Dr. Chester Koblinski. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, Melanie, and, and uh, thank everybody in the audience and, and uh, on the uh, on the webcast. Um, today I'd like to uh, talk with you about climate change and adaptation uh, from a fairly broad perspective. And um, to introduce this, uh, you know, start maybe a by saying a little bit about what we do at, in our organization, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, we are responsible for uh, monitoring and archiving not just the weather and giving you the daily weather forecast, but also uh, monitoring and sustaining a record to look at how climate uh, is evolving, understanding the current state of the climate and how it um, relates to the past, and then understanding how the climate system works and trying to estimate um, how it's going to look next winter uh, next year and long term into the long term future and we provide information to the public through a variety of sources and work with a number of other federal agencies state agencies uh, local as well as international uh, groups uh, on this very complicated big issue and uh, important topic for the 21st century. So part of that uh, led us to a uh, involvement uh, many years ago in King County Washington where Ron Sims is the, uh, was the uh, county commissioner, uh, you all well know, and his chief of staff at that time, Jim Lopez. Both of them ended up uh, coming here with the Obama administration. And we continued our conversations with them, and it led to this involvement or interest in trying to look at, uh, start up some uh, small studies, looking at potential vulnerabilities, especially in coastal regions, uh, for uh, urban development. And in order to do that, we realized we had to park someone here who um, understood what we did and could get involved with you and begin to mix and match data and information and directions. And that person has been Josh Murphy. So we really want to thank Josh for not just inviting me here to this presentation, uh, but to working with you all over the past year and hopefully into the future to uh, begin to tackle how you bring climate information into your business and uh, hopefully improve uh, the developments in the future for the, for the country. Uh, secondly, uh, I've got a question for you since you all are uh, building-oriented people, I hope. And if there's others, that's certainly fine because I understand it's a fairly broad audience. And this has to do more with weather adaptation. It's 100, over 100 degrees, I think, outside. Uh, it's hot, everybody's dressing a little more casually than usual. Uh, so we walked down from the metro and walked into this building, which is pretty strongly air conditioned. And as usual, I found myself sweating profusely. Suddenly, the minute I walk into the cold building, I would have thought that would have been happening outside. Uh, and this has happened before, but I still haven't figured out how I adapt to that. Do I walk into the building slower? Do I have a cup of coffee when I, before I come in? Uh, and then I found when I put my suit coat jacket, it, I actually cooled down more. I don't know if that was just, uh, but I'm looking for the answer to that question afterwards on how I adapt to Washington after 30 years of not being able to figure this out. 
Um, so let me uh, begin by sort of uh, introducing the basic topic of climate change uh, from a scientific perspective and um, then uh, walking through some of the, uh, how this information affects uh, various uh, communities, sea level rise, heavy rainfall, uh, heat as simple examples of where uh, climate, weather, and, and as that changes in the future, how it has impacts on different missions of different federal agencies. And certainly some examples towards the end of tools and things we're doing with communities involved with built infrastructure uh, to begin to understand how we might do it. We don't do adaptation in our in our agency except for uh, trying to uh, improve our own uh, infrastructure. Inf uh, adaptation itself is more the engineering and the uh, changes that you're going to have to make or changes to natural ecosystems that will happen, uh, providing better corridors for wildlife, et cetera, that will happen in the future that we'll have to work on. Uh, but that's more left in the hands of yourselves and others that do this sort of thing. And it's a very, since it's a really complicated thing and it doesn't happen quickly, it's uh, very hard to begin to, and there's a lot of risk and uncertainty on how you might do it going forward. It's a pretty challenging endeavor, not to mention the political climate uh, that's certainly involved in this on you know, how far do you go on a particular methodology to make changes uh, and insert policy into the perspective. So if we could, I guess I channel the slides. So. I'll start with sort of this, this, uh, this slide starts by giving you a broad spectrum of uh, you know, cl some climate change issues, uh, some of the scientific problems related to it, and then basically a description of adaptation and mitigation. So you know, I've heard some great uh, simple explanations about uh, why the climate is the way it is here and why, it cha why it's changing. And I think you've probably all heard it, but it's in case you're you know, challenged by it or want to think about it, um, when astronomers or others try to estimate the basic temperature of the planet, uh, simply from an estimate of how much radiation hits the planet from the sun, uh, and then try to understand whether it's absorbed as a rock ball and re-radiates out much like a, what we call a black body, in other words, Keynes equilibrium with solar radiation, you can do a fairly simple calculation and get the temperature pretty much right for Mercury and Mars, but you can't do it for the Earth or Venus without including what happens in the atmospheres of those two planets. And that actually adds to a warming of those planets uh, more substantial than you'd get with a direct estimate of just looking at the radiation of the planet, the radiation impact on the planet itself. You have to understand the fact that those atmospheres are absorbing the long wave radiation that's sending, uh, that's, uh, that happens once you heat the ball and it starts re-radiating out at different frequencies, the atmosphere itself starts to absorb some of that help, uh, heat and re-radiates it at different frequencies and causes not just radiation out from the planet but also radiation into the planet so it holds, it holds temperature around the planet. You can use a blanket example, it's not quite the same, but that's the basic idea. And so obviously, as you, as you add some of these absorbing gases to the, at, to the atmosphere through, sort of, through the emissions process, uh, CO2 is a big absorber, methane's a big absorber, and many others. Uh, water vapor, for example, is, is another one. Uh, you add to that, and it leads to an increased warming of, uh, of your planet. And you can estimate that with a model, and we've done that very successfully for the Earth. We can replicate the warming that's observed for the last century on this planet. Uh, and these models can also show that you, you can replicate that warming and you can project ahead uh, with some uncertainty because you don't know how much emission is going to happen. You don't know land use, land change effects in the future, and, and you try to estimate that. Uh, so that leads to this uh, understanding. It's very, you really can't do it any other way. And there's been enormous uh, dialogue in the scientific community for decades about what else could be causing this warming of the planet. Uh, could it be changes in solar uh, energy? Could it be cosmic rays? Could it be volcanic effects, uh, et cetera? And any time you try to use those different effects to try and estimate the warming of the planet, it just doesn't work. It's just not enough uh, compared to what we can do with these absorbing gases, the addition of absorbing gases and the re-radiation warming of the planet. So given that, the target now is to try and understand 
um, uh, what you can do about it, what may happen in the future, and how this will play out. And also try to understand what you need to observe and what the impacts are uh, uh, potentially on the planet. Um, so we're doing that. And, um, you know, so what do you see? Uh, we've got a, a fairly extensive monitoring uh, uh, capability around the planet, and you certainly observe uh, rising temperatures. Uh, that's been challenged. People argued that, well, the atmosphere is not warming as much as the surface, that, uh, that all, all that data was rescrubbed. We found a slight error. Now the atmosphere is found to be warming quite consistently with the surface temperatures. Uh, you expect as the temperature warms from basic physics that the atmosphere can retain more water in it. So that leads to heavier rainfall. Uh, and indeed, that's what's observed. You observe more rainfall slightly uh, on average over the continent, but you've really detected now much more increased uh, heavy rain that I'll talk about in a little while in specific regions of the country like the Northeast. So if you're a builder, if you've got infrastructure, you really start getting concerned uh, with those issues. Uh, as you rise uh, the temperature, you expand uh, the volume of the water. Uh, water heats, uh, it expands. Uh, and as you uh, heat ice sheets, they begin to melt. So that leads to more water in the oceans, and therefore the volume's not changing, so the, the level begins to increase, uh, and it leads to slight, uh, slight changes in sea level rise, which have been observed for the last 200 years, uh, at about the rate that it's expected. Um, you'd expect as it gets warmer that you're gonna have longer growing seasons. Indeed, that seems to be uh, going on from a number of estimates of where the plant cycles are occurring. And not only that, um, we found that even with our production of normal climatologies that we do within NOAA on a decadal basis uh, that we're asked to do by the country and provide that to the nation, those climatologies are changing slowly in the country and the growing regions are changing. So this year when we, re or a few years, a couple years ago when we produced our latest climatology, USDA, uh, looked at them and, and also changed its growing uh, patterns and growing regions uh, slightly. Um, you know, you'd expect to see changes in snow cover, uh, changes in sea ice, uh, changes in the ice sheets, and slowly we're observing all of that. Uh, and we're certainly observing that as it warms, uh, you get snow, snow, and the snow rainfall, the freezing point on a mountain begins to move up. Uh, so a lot of concerns there about water storage, water supply, but also looking at ecosystems, uh, what happens to those ecosystems that are high alpine and begin to be pushed up to the point where they uh, uh, can't live anymore uh, at altitude on a given, uh, given place. Certainly that change in the water cycle is slowly leading to changes in the amounts and timings of river flow, so we've done a lot of work, Bureau of Reclamation, Army Corps of Engineers, the Department of Interior, it's not like these things are changing so dramatically that you see them on a day-to-day -day basis. They're changing very slowly over time, and it's really a multi-generational issue that we're trying to attack. And we have some time, but it's not clear how much time all set that we'll have to really make substantial changes to do this. But I think in a given planning cycles, we can be smart. We can try to begin to learn from this. We can try to understand the uncertainties and the risks of making certain changes and begin to be smarter about the way we do things so that over time we'll be able to um, recognize these changes and adapt and, and change uh, our infrastructure and our capabilities so that we will not have uh, dramatic shifts, hopefully, and in, 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 uh, that will affect us in a, in a, in a dramatic way. Uh, and then certainly, uh, obviously, have a long discussion that's gone on to this country in quite a long time and many others about how might you mitigate it and how might you try to reduce emissions. And that gets into the whole discussion about climate and energy that we won't talk here, but obviously you can read about it in the newspaper quite frequently and, and read about the political debates about that. So this slide begins to talk about definitions, adaptation that I talked about responding to present and future climatic changes that we'll talk a lot about here, and then this other one, mitigation, what are the op options for limiting uh, climate change that I really won't talk about here. That's, uh, I didn't think that was the right talk for this audience, nor is it necessarily our uh, expertise on how you change energy systems. Although I know here there's a lot of interest on, on uh, the energy usage of buildings, and uh, because buildings and the use of energy by buildings is a big uh, consumer, and 
does have an effect on the carbon budget and maybe something we could talk a little bit about in, in the question and answers. It was interesting, we were talking on the way down about a uh, discussion that New York City had given us a few, maybe a month ago, where they're really doing a very detailed analysis of infrastructure and energy usage and consumption. And, and I thought, you know, and very much into the numbers to really understand this issue of where their efficiencies are and where their inefficiencies are, and really kind of narrowed it down to 40 major buildings in New York City, they said, I assume that's public knowledge up there at least, uh, and they're trying to understand how they might deal with those, especially those 40 buildings, which would really make their usage of energy much more efficient. So some, uh, you know, there, are, there is a variety of action at the municipal, state, and, and certainly federal level on how we uh, begin to work on this issue and work on it together, especially important. Um, and we're hearing a lot, both at these various levels. And so we've begun to establish a forum for this through the U.S. Global Change Research Program, uh, which initially had been established to try and uh, coordinate on the scientific and the research related to global change, but more and more so our new strategy has identified that, that more and more so we want to reach out to mission agencies and get them involved. Uh, a lot of you are mandated to uh, 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 utilize climate change information in your future planning and, and work. Uh, either through congressional mandate or through the executive order uh, in the White House, so it's a 13514. Um, and there is an adaptation committee now uh, set up uh, in the Council of Environmental Quality. But this globe, uh, group on global change research is looking for uh, more and more so that mission driven agencies can send representation to this committee and begin to talk about this issue so that we can coordinate, especially on information exchange and help uh, groups like yourself begin to tie into more, uh, more and better uh, information on this subject and tie into something I'll talk about at the end, the national assessment process, which is trying to synthesize knowledge on climate, uh, crowdsourcing, if you will, but a very complicated crowdsourcing, uh, to provide a, a synthesized, well-reviewed, vetted, and essentially stamped by the nation of here's our understanding of climate change today in the United States. As you know, probably there is an international process to do that, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and I won't talk about that, but you can, you can find that on the web. Uh, so let me uh, move on. Uh, I think Melanie will probably have to tell me that I'll be running over here in another couple of slides and, and uh, uh, we'll run out of time. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, this issue about scientific consensus that the Earth's climate is changing due to increased concentrations of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So the consensus part comes through this uh, assessment process. And that allows not only scientific synthesis of the information, but governmental review of the documents and governmental approval of the message in these documents. I think that's very important to understand that these messages about unequivocal uh, climate change and unequivocal human impact on climate change are coming after enormous uh, review and synthesis on what's available, what the knowledge is on climate change, what's been measured, what's been modeled, what's been studied, what's been put out in peer-reviewed literature and then synthesized into these both international and national assessments uh, and then gotten strict government review. So you can only imagine when the uh, diplomats come in the room and begin to review kind of the synthesis and key messages of those documents word by word. You've got 170 countries sitting around the, the room uh, going back and forth with the scientific uh, community. Um, very challenging, but nevertheless, they come up with these very strong messages, I think, despite that a lot of the science communities think they're even conservative at that point. Uh, very strong messages that these indicators that uh, uh, carbon dioxide and many other greenhouse gases, these gases that absorb heat and re-radiate, are for the most part, the arises are, there are certainly some natural causes of the rises, but for the most part being caused by human uh, contributions, are leading to this warming signal that you see. This is the global average temperature shown in the color, uh, the bar chart on the left, and it's relative to a mean temperature you know, you've got it around 57.6 mean temperature, and then you can see year by year, the year annual average shows that it's below that 57.6, and from 1880 up to about 1940, but then from 1940 up to 2010, excuse me, uh, it's risen. 
uh, to more than or close to a, uh, a degree Fahrenheit uh, since about 1940, above that mean. So overall, it's a fairly dramatic rise over that time period. And indeed, uh, that not only measured, but we can also model that and we can also estimate in the future it's going to continue and be much more substantial in the future of a few degrees. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's not, there's a long story about that that certainly you can read in these assessments. I won't uh, go beyond that. I'd like to talk to you instead about a couple of examples of parameters over the United States that are especially uh, impact, uh, impacting built infrastructure uh, that you're interested in, many other issues, certainly. But if you look at uh, these three charts, the upper left shows the observed pattern of number of days over 100 degree Fahrenheit that have been observed between 1960 and 1980, essentially 61 to 79. And so you can see that the yellow there is essentially saying, well, we've got 10 to 15 days. You can see the color bar at the bottom. So in places like Maryland, it's basically yellow, and it's probably 10 or 15 days out of the year. Uh, on average, between 1961 and 79, had a number of days over 100. So today, for example, is one of those days, <laughs> uh, at least in DC, maybe in greater Maryland, I'm not sure. Uh, but there are places like southern Arizona, uh, uh, you know, the eastern part of southern California, uh, et cetera, that are much more substantial. They're getting 90 days, say, or, or 100 days a year where they're getting days over 100, and that's measured, that's observed. Um, uh, on a, I guess that's on average. Uh, and then uh, if you look into the future and you try to estimate this, and these are where the modeling estimates come in, and, you know, again, if you're trying to look out 100 years, uh, you've got to try and guess, well, what's the technology going to be like then? What's the What's the emissions of gases into the atmosphere? What's the load of these greenhouse gases going to be like, either from natural emissions or uh, human emissions? Land use comes into there and some other issues. Uh, and a fairly complicated model. We certainly don't have time to talk about it here. You can read about it. It's all on the literature. Uh, but you begin to see the red areas are dramatic, not only for a low scenario, which is almost business as usual or even capping it, you find that throughout the Midwest, certainly uh, in the Great Plains area, you've got a lot more 100 degrees days showing up. And then if you go to a high scenario where not only emissions are at present rate, but they're increasing, you find that the number of 100 degrees are ramped up substantially. And this is really not just, it's really dry heat almost. It's kind of the temp like the temperature today that you uh, had. A lot of people are beginning to look at what we call the wet heat. That's the atmosphere as saturated with water vapor. When that goes over 98.6 degrees, you really don't want to be outside because your body can't uh, give off heat at that point. You don't, you don't gain by sweating and going through evapotranspiration. It, it, it can't do that. So, um, you know, and there are places when they've begun to map that out, what's called heat stress index, and that you can get a heat stress index even for today in different places. There's a lot of concern about that, and certainly then building issues come into play, trying to understand how you're going to keep the temperature of a building uh, adequate and appropriate to deal with uh, conditions like that uh, certainly becomes serious. And so urban areas especially that are affected, you remember reading about the big heat wave that hit Europe a few years ago and tens of thousands of people were dying because they didn't have the proper heating in the cities. Um, this is a serious condition, and certainly I hope this group is thinking about that, uh, especially for uh, those that are going to have to use uh, your buildings in the future to live. Next, so that's the heat, uh, a brief one on heat. And if we move forward, um, like I told you, the, uh, the uh, amount of water vapor in the atmosphere increases as you increase the heat. And so you expect that... Um, as rain falls, especially intense rain, it's going to carry more water with it. And that's been observed over here the past 50 years. And what we found is that, so this graphic is saying that, look, we've looked at that in New England. So these are the, high, the most intense storms, the high, you know, the most intense storms that carry water with it. And we measure the rainfall in those intense storms, say the top 1% storms. And we find that um, relative to, say, a 100-year record, the, or the change in that 50 years has increased by 67% the amount of water coming down in these heavy storms in New England 
the Mid-Atlantic. So who cares about that sort of thing? Well, if you're, in, if you're in New York City and your drainage system has been built to carry twice the normal load and it mixes sewage in with runoff, um, we talked to the uh, environmental commissioner in New York City a few years ago and she said, look, this is the kind of thing that concerns us the most. We need to know if we need to increase the width of these pipes and the sewer systems because you certainly don't want backup uh, in the runoff and drainage systems in a city, in an urban city. Uh, and that's obvious. But you see, as you look at other parts of the country, it varies. And so it's this concept, much like the heat you see, you don't get a, a consistent map throughout the country on any of these issues. There are regionalities to all this information and regional definitions. And every kind of part of the country has different vulnerabilities. You might have more population. We'll get to this later. And so these issues of vulnerability and what you might attack from a point of view of adaptation changes depending on where you are. If you're in the Northeast, obviously you're going to be more worried about the water issue. If you're down in the Southwest, you're more worried about the heat issue. Um, and and uh, that comes in kind of in this slide, which from a water perspective talks about you know, this very issue. Uh, that in the Northeast, you're really concerned much more about the flooding and the drainage issues uh, and how your infrastructure is related to that, whereas if you're in the Southwest, you're more worried about water supply. Water's gold in the West. Water's going down in the West. The West's got a problem. Can they sustain agriculture, industry, uh, livestock the way they have in the past if their water supply is decreasing? Can they continue to build these uh, large cities and infrastructure out there that people really like? Uh, given this uh, rapid or, or dramatic change in water that they're feeling. We've looked at the historical record, the paleo record, going back to 800 uh, or 1,200 years ago. And there you had kind of a little warming in the planet from about 900 to 1,300, uh, you know, maybe a half a degree or, or a little bit more. And um, so more than usual, it had been warmer. And in the Southwest, uh, there had been 50-year droughts that show up in the, in the long-term record during you know, a time when there was indigenous populations in there. And that's why you had movements of indigenous populations in those regions trying to get to areas where water was more plentiful. So clearly, uh, it's something we need to be concerned about and are working carefully with a number of agencies that are, are mission-oriented on water. Uh, to try and address this issue. In fact, we, we got authorization several years ago to build an early warning system on drought that we're, we are having a lot of success with and finding now that as we build this, more and more so states and other entities are preparing more rapidly because they can work with us on an almost day-to-day -day basis to understand the development of droughts in these regions and can begin to prepare for them much sooner than they did in the past. So along with, with climate changes, uh, we have uh, other changes going on uh, that we're well aware of. Uh, these are the changes in population over the last 40 years. Um, and probably more familiar to some of you than, uh, than, uh, than to us, perhaps, even because we're more interested in the science uh, and the impacts on your trying to deal with population changes. Uh, and we measure it in the Department of Commerce, so we try to keep track of it. Um, and what's interesting here is that, uh, you know, this is data, but uh, a few weeks ago I was in uh, northwest Oregon, and it's remarkable there. You can see it in, in rows there just south and, and west of Portland that there has been a dramatic rise in population out there. It's, a lot of it's the wine industry, quite honestly, has really taken off. Uh, and it seemed to me that it was a lot of wine growers out there that I didn't see 40 years ago when I used to go there. Uh, and obviously other parts of the country for different reasons, the, the, the middle parts, uh, the, great, the Great Plains, for example, is maybe uh, people moving to more urban areas and larger farms, et cetera. I, I don't know. You probably know a lot more than that. But this plays into the topic of vulnerability, where populations are moving and as we try to build accommodations for them or as they move into areas that used to be rural and had a lot of natural ecosystems. This is, this is changing things as well as our own, uh, as, as well as the climate uh, system itself. And so it leads to interactions between um, weather and climate, uh, such as, you know, things like that you may not think about. Um, what happens to the electrical grid nowadays? As it becomes more intense, we become more reliant on the electrical system. 
what happens to that system? Is it affected by this uh, change in the patterns of weather, climate? So this looks at you know, how have the number of electrical grid disturbances changed over the last 20 years? And basically, you look at the chart without even reading the words, and you see, well, it's increasing. There's more stuff going on on the right. And that says that the number of incidents where the grid disturbances has increased uh, slowly since 1992 up to, up to 2008. And it results from these things that are written out, wildfire, temperature extremes, uh, thunderstorms, et cetera. And so, so what's going on? And, and what was interesting, I was at a, at a lecture a few months ago out in California where they're having a big discussion on climate and extremes and what they can do in the state. And someone had overlaid uh, wildfire disturbances and projected areas that were vulnerable to wildfire in California and the electrical network. And sure enough, uh, big trunk lines coming down from Nevada from the hydropower systems, I guess, up in the Northwest. Uh, we're cutting right through these uh, areas of intense project, projected intense uh, uh, fire. And may not have happened yet, but they were saying, whoops, you know, what are we going to do there? Uh, it seems like we've built an infrastructure that's going right through where we expect to have some real natural disaster changes, and we've really got to think through uh, how we can deal with that and maybe at least uh, think ahead. Uh, and uh, begin to prepare for it. No solutions, obviously. These are all challenging issues. Uh, but you can go on, you know, you can go around and around on a number of these issues. This one is looking at sea level rise and uh, highways in the, uh, or roads in the, in the Gulf. And obviously this is something came up there in Katrina. Uh, and uh, here you see road systems relative to their elevation next to sea level. So anything that's uh, below four feet, that is uh, four feet, I guess it's four feet above mean sea level. So right now it's above sea level, right? We're not driving underwater down there. But as you expect, sea level rise itself is fairly gradual, but there's a lot of things that go with it. Storm intensity, surges come up. Uh, you've got subsidence going on down th there in that region. So slowly, again, over time, certainly in a hurricane situation, their road systems, uh, our road systems are, are becoming more and more vulnerable to uh, environmental changes in the ocean relative to sea level rise, inundation, coastal storms, et cetera. Uh, so at least we're at the point where, um, you know, we're working on these systems. Hopefully we're working together. That's why I think it was really valuable that Josh came here and began to blend these data, your data sets together with ours to begin to look at these issues of where, uh, where we're having vulnerability. So the next slide begins to try and estimate, well, how would you, est how would you go about estimating? So you got all this data. You kind of know what's going on in the environment with their storms, sea level, heat, water, et cetera, wildfires, all that stuff. And then you've got these social parameters about where people are living, what type of infrastructure they have, and how it's playing out. And what this map is trying to look at is what are common patterns and where can you say social systems are more vulnerable in a very general sense than others. And so it uses what's called principal component analysis. Principal component analysis tries to look at uh, strong correlation patterns between a number of variables, in this sense in a spatial area, not a temporal sense. Um, and so, uh, you can look at it uh, in terms of high or low vulnerability through this estimate. Obviously, you can argue any particular uh, item because it may not be symptomatic of a particular area. But it suggests that the Northeast, for example, uh, for some issues, you might say sea level might be a problem up in the Northeast, uh, has lower vulner you know, has some patterns where, uh, where there's low vulnerability. Uh, whereas in the mountain regions or the mountain and the Great Plains in the West, you've got a lot of red where there's higher variability. Maybe it's wildfires, maybe it's uh, agricultural issues, uh, population spread. Maybe we can come back to this at the end because there's a lot of complexity in this chart. But what it's trying to get at is are there common areas? Can you begin to evaluate where you're getting vulnerability in this social vulnerability in this country to these environmental events? And can you begin to map it either individually, as you showed with those individual examples, or in a common sense across the country uh, to try and have dialogues with various groups that are responsible for some of the social infrastructure 
and begin to uh, help them uh, address it. So um, we've had, like I said at the beginning, uh, a number of discussions growing uh, over at least the past decade, if not more, with mission agencies such as your own, heat, public land, agriculture, uh, social service providers, uh, infrastructure estimates, more and more so as people um, are either uh, feeling the effect of environmental events that I've been talking about or suspecting it's coming or they're mandated by Congress to, in, to uh, uh, bring environmental change or estimates of climate change into their future plans, et cetera. They want to engage with the scientists and they want to learn how can we do a better job? How can we make choices that are going to be uh, good for the country, uh, good for the population, and try to protect ourselves against uh, what might be coming? Uh, we always want to know what the future is and try to be ready for it. Um, and so these uh, examples I give here give you some of the ideas of, of some of the things we're talking about with these agencies. Health, we've been talking a lot with the Center for Disease Control. We've now got an MOU with them. Uh, National Institutes of Health, certainly, on disease changes, effects of extreme heat, air pollution, uh, heavy rainfall, uh, changes in disease vectors, uh, how diseases are ch disease spreading changes. Um, public land managers looking at not only the issues listed here, but their, but their governance of public lands, the ecosystems, the wildlife corridors, things like that. Department of Interior, a lot of work with agriculture or the wildlife agencies, including our own National Marine Fisheries on potential impacts to uh, food and uh, wildlife. Uh, social service providers like yourselves, uh, infrastructure, uh, energy builders, uh, insurance sectors, uh, people building uh, concrete and, and, and other issues. And, and I think it's slowly uh, providing us with some opportunities to begin to factor uh, what we know, uh, what we don't know, what the potential risks are of making change uh, into making good governance and good decisions as we go forward to try and factor disaster and planning into management things, building better sustainable communities, um, reducing energy use, reducing certainly our carbon footprint overall and trying to migrate uh, human health, addressing human health and livelihood issues. Um, and so here you see the huge challenge of trying to talk to folks like us that are scientists, introverts, you know, don't want to, you know, a little bit more, you know, the communication issue here is a big one. Actually, that's the one we find is the most interesting. You know, so we try and experiment like we park someone like Josh over here. He doesn't know any of you. You don't know what the heck he does. But somehow you've, you've communicated with each other, you've begun to set up things and begun to work together. And I think that's great. And I think it gives you a sense of the kind of people we need to begin to hire and look to hire in the future, this need to build uh, folks that are more interdisciplinary. Either they learn it in college, which is, which is difficult because of the, uh, well, I think college, actually I looked at my own past college, and I, I was glad to see that they have a sustainability committee and they're beginning to build more interdisciplinary uh, uh, courses. I'd shut them off because they weren't doing anything, but you know, if I don't contribute a lot to them anyway, so they didn't really care. But I was glad to see that college curriculums are beginning to address this issue, but also I think the potential of doing this, bringing interns in, bringing uh, folks in that can work across agencies, especially in the fed federal sector, is really important to try and try and deal with challenges like this that are really cross-agency uh, and really require work across the board. Um, I guess these next uh, couple of issues begin to look at, to sort of close out here, you know, what kind of tools are we building uh, through this engagement that we're having with, with other agencies that allow you to begin to tap into our information base and vice versa? And this is actually one of the biggest challenges we've found. You know, we've taken, um, so I had a number of people come to me from different agencies about five years ago. And they were challenged because they had to factor climate change into their long-term plans. So they said, you know, what are your models telling us? Can you just give us the output of your model? I said, you really don't want that. You know, you don't want all these bits of data and stuff. You're not gonna understand it. So I said, why don't you come up to our big modeling center that we have in Princeton that do this sort of thing, and let's have a big discussion. 
or let's go out to the Aspen Change Institute. That was another group, and we'll bring together the modeling community with you all. And, and, and it turned out to be initially kind of adversarial. You know, the, you walk in and you say, look, I need your output. I need to know what's gonna happen here in 10 years. And they say, no way, you know, you're not gonna understand this stuff. We don't have a lot of predictability. You'll totally misinterpret this stuff. And um, so we said, well, we got a problem. You know, we need to communicate. We need to have some way of uh, taking the information we have and converting it into useful um, estimates for you um, and including our understanding of the uncertainty and risk of our information that's with it because you might make some choices behind it that would be pretty serious. And in a sense, we learned that you just can't hand this stuff off. You really have to have an engagement between the scientific community and those like yourselves that are trying to make decisions on uh, property where climate is just one factor. And more and more so, that's really what we're trying to build is an engagement process. Again, this interdisciplinary idea of bringing people together. And out of those kind of uh, engagements come these kind of tools that I'll talk about uh, that we go back and begin to build tools that allow us, or someone like Josh comes in and hopefully helps you build tools that allow you to understand this information in a context that you use, the, you know, you, you need, you need an information from the environment, but you need it in a particular way. And we don't necessarily give, provide that. And so we need to work together to convert our information and your information so that they link up and we get some understanding of what this all means. So gadgets like this, which uh, it's hard to see here, and maybe you'll get a better idea by going on our websites. This one in particular is from uh, being developed out of our Coastal Services Center, uh, the headquarters of which is down in Charleston, South Carolina. And they're looking at coasts uh, relative to climate impacts on the coast, so certainly big inundation, uh, dealing with storms and increased storminess. Uh, and trying to understand uh, this whole issue of how you build information. Whoops, I just shut myself off here. Okay, good. Um, and then trying to identify, uh, you know, how do you do a vulnerability assessment based on what we know about the environment and what we know about um, where the floodplains are, in this case in the Gulf, especially along the Louisiana coast. So you can see here, Based on this particular analysis, they're showing very high vulnerability. I'll give you a little more detail on that shortly uh, along the Louisiana coast. And now, you won't be able to read this uh, directly on the screen, so I hope you take a look at the PowerPoint and go to this website uh, afterwards. They built a really interesting tool called Coastal Community uh, Snapshots where they've begun to merge a lot of social information along with estimates of no or knowledge about the uh, floodplain, the amount of wetland in the area, uh, where different types of populations are, aging populations, impoverished populations, uh, and try to think, uh, think through um, where we got problems and where we don't for um, populations in those regions. So let me sort of talk you through this one. This is Tammany Parish. So Tammany Parish is north of New Orleans, kind of on the uh, Mississippi border, it's in Louisiana, it's that yellow block uh, just north of New Orleans, if you can see it from your seats. Um, so uh, it's Bay St. Louis, uh, if you know that area, it's north of Lake Pontchartrain. So uh, this one, this particular analysis is looking, and this is done for all the coasts of the U.S., it's not just the Gulf region, so you can go in and tap the system around and play around with it. So you can look at, not shown here, where, how much wetland they have in that region, how it's been mapped. But here in particular, it's looking at different populations and whether or not um, they're within a floodplain or uh, not. In other words, they're potentially uh, exposed to risk from flooding. They're with, you know, below the floodplain area. And there's a whole debate about how do you estimate a floodplain and how we'll build a floodplain for the future. We won't go there right now. So you can see that for the general population, they've got 190,000 people. You can't read this, so I'll just tell you what it says. And that's the left-hand big circle there that's divided in the middle by a white line and has dark blue and light blue. And says, look, we've got 190,000 people living in this uh, parish, um, and about 42%, um, no, 48%, sorry, are above the floodplain, 
and 52% are below the floodplain. So 52% are not in a good situation if they get a lot of flooding. And I'll tell you an anecdote about Bay St. Louis from uh, later. Uh, and then if you look at, well, let's, you know, who's, vulnerable, who's most vulnerable in our population? Well, certainly those that are over uh, 65 or those that are impoverished based on, you know, the uh, standard of poverty. Uh, and it shows here that in the middle section for the population that's over 65, um, it's a, similar to the regular population. Here you've got about 18,000 or 19,000 people total that are above 65. So it's about a tenth of the overall population. And it's basically the same vulnerability as the regular population. But when you look at the impoverished population, which is also about 10%, uh, slightly more, it's not dramatically different, but slightly more are living in the floodplain. So they're more vulnerable. So you get into, you begin to get into these questions of social justice. Or is it right that the impoverished are being pushed? I don't know if it's being pushed. Maybe that's where they live. Maybe that's where they can best get their livelihood. Um, but clearly, that's beginning to get at this issue of how do you find out, how do you map these different data sets? If you're trying to build structures in those regions, where can you put, place them so they're less vulnerable and begin to tackle this question of social justice? And you can go around the country. If you go to Terrebonne County, for example, uh, which is south of New Orleans on the coast, you'll find that it's dominated by wetlands and most of the population there is living uh, in the floodplain and, and are really uh, in jeopardy of flooding under any strong storm condition. If you go to the West Coast, you look at San Diego County, uh, very few, you know, it's a very low floodplain. There's not a lot of uh, structure or population in the floodplain at all. It's a very narrow uh, selection of the population. So obviously it varies considerably around the country. Um, but it gives you a sense of a very nice tool to begin to look at these sorts of things and begin to play around with them. And I hope. Uh, is useful to the sorts of things uh, that you do uh, here. Um, so let me go on and sort of wrap up with just one, uh, one more example. A lot of us are seeing a lot of more and more green building uh, going around in cities. This is a case of Philadelphia uh, trying to, again, improve flood resilience by providing a lot of green, uh, green buildings, uh, greenway areas in their buildings and infrastructure. Uh, you know, and a number of cities are doing this. I know Sh Chicago's been working on this quite a bit. Uh, Seattle, uh, where Ron Sims had come, was, was very famous for, for trying to develop this in King County in Seattle. Uh, I was noticing just the other day, looking down at the new metro complex they're building in Silver Spring. It's going to have a green roof to some extent on it. They're putting a lot of plants and et cetera so that it can absorb water and cause uh, less flooding in that region. So uh, that's great. I want to uh, end, because I know I've kind of rambled on here, uh, with just some basic take-home messages that I hope you've captured from this talk, uh, is that um, the impacts of climate change uh, are already occurring throughout the United States and will continue to occur in the future. And so this whole communication conversations between those that are studying, monitoring, and detecting climate change as well as even short-term climate variability are available and ready to talk to people and convert this science into hopefully useful needs and work with you. Um, and this, and for most importantly, I think that this information is really being synthesized through these uh, large assessment process. There's a national assessment going on right now that'll produce the latest estimate uh, at the end of next year of climate change in the United States. And the previous one in 2009 is what you're seeing a lot of the output from. So in other words, you're not seeing one-off individual researcher presentations here. You're seeing a compendium and synthesis of the knowledge of climate in the United States from these assessments based on all research that's peer, rigorously peer-reviewed uh, and, and argued about and reviewed uh, afterwards. And it's clear, I think, that you can see even from the slight information I provided here, you're seeing impacts across a variety of sectors uh, and regions, and it differs and varies. And so you need to dig into this at a regional level, begin to understand the very vulnerability. Um, and it's not something, again, the need to work directly with the climate community to try and sort this out with your own community uh, because you bring a lot of valuable uh, information yourself, obviously. And preparing for and responding uh, requires action at all levels. It's not just us at the feds. It's people going on very locally, on up through the states, the regions, the tribal communities, et cetera. Uh, all of them are very active. Even, even, for example, we had a very fascinating discussion with religious leaders here about two months ago uh, who are 
trying to work with us or trying to understand how they communicate with their populations at the 340,000 churches and synagogues across the country, which is where a tremendous amount of engagement goes on weekly, uh, and trying to understand stewardship of the environment as a major uh, issue for them. And certainly federal agencies play a critical role uh, and are doing a lot right now to coordinate through this committee that's run by the Council of Environmental Quality, through the Global Change Research Program, and other subcommittees of the National Science and uh, Technology Council. So a lot going on, and uh, I hope this uh, talk uh, provided an introduction for those of you that aren't involved, and hopefully you all will get involved or at least begin to be aware of this. There's a number of resources for you to tackle and, and tap into that give you much more detail than I've provided here. Uh, one is certainly a Global Change Research Program, which is building a much more extensive website so that we can begin to, we're very cognizant of the fact that people, the, one of the questions people ask is, where do I go? Where do I get begin to introduce myself to this information. And you know, you can go to a website and an agency, but then it turns out there's tons of websites at a given agency. You're trying to find what's my point of entry if, if I'm a, uh, trying to make decisions or gain interest in this. So the Global Change Research Program, which is based upon an authorization of Congress in 1991 and includes 13 agencies, especially they're involved in the research, uh, anywhere from the National Science Foundation through ourselves over to the Department of Agriculture, Transportation. HUD is not involved, but please get involved. Uh, uh, I think it's more and more so we need those that are going to be impact, dealing with the impacts of climate to be involved with us. Uh, we've also uh, working on our next national assessment through the Global Change Research Program actively underway. This is mandated by public law to be done every four years. So the next one's due on December 13th, and a huge uh, enterprise is underway to do that, and not only turn out the huge book that uh, people find kind of daunting to deal with, but to make the information much more uh, flexible, pliable, and available to, to, uh, through, to people from a variety of walks of life in this country through electronic and public uh, dissemination. And then uh, a variety of studies that have been carried out by the National Academies of Science, again, big books, but uh, they've begun to tailor them down into nice electronic and uh, video messaging. messaging. Uh, and then ourselves, uh, we've begun to build a central focus uh, within NOAA, the climate portal that we call it, www.climate.gov, which, which I hope more and more so has provided a variety of information, not just direct access to the data and information, but various levels of um, uh, communication tools, either the scientific articles or synthesized articles, more popular and, and easier to read, and education and communication tools that will help you out. So hopefully it provides a much clearer entryway into our vast holdings of information, uh, vast but still inadequate, I'm sure. So anyways, thanks very much. I hope we have a few questions. Uh, I've got five minutes, so I rambled on for 55 minutes. I told you I'd do that. Uh, sorry about that. I know it's a hot day, and it's hard to listen to somebody for 55 minutes, but I appreciate you very much. Thank you. So uh, first of all, thanks a lot for sharing this. A wonderful presentation. Uh, a question I have is, as a scientist, how frustrating is the political discourse around climate change? Well, it's really frustrating, obviously. And, and I think it's, um, you know, I can understand that there's a political calculus to this problem that um, plays itself out. Uh, and we've had that conversation uh, with them, especially lately, because we did try to propose, the president uh, endorsed a setting up a climate service in our agency. Uh, and we got involved in, in the political calculus and lost our proposal. They didn't want to fund that at this time. So it's tremendously frustrating because I think the scientific community uh, as a whole uh, is very concerned about this issue and uh, the potential impact not only in our country but around the world and consider it quite seriously. We think a lot of the estimates that come out of these assessments because they're um, worked across a number of groups, come out kind of watered down. And uh, unless there's some serious changes about uh, our impact on the physics of the problem, it's, it's going to even get worse. And this is not a gas that simply has a short lifetime in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide's got a lifetime in the atmosphere of hundreds of years. So we've already got something in the bank 
Furthermore, the ocean is kind of the storage bank for heat and fresh water, et cetera. And the ocean has turnover cycles on the order of hundreds of years for heat. Uh, so this stuff's going to happen, and we need to get ready for it. And I think certainly from the scientific point of view, the biggest concern is any abrupt changes that may happen, not only in the physical system, but maybe some of you saw the article in Nature uh, just a couple of weeks ago on potential biodiversity tipping points going on that could be very dramatic uh, um, you know, soon. So we've really got to realize as a planet that we're having a huge impact and, and we've got to work together to try and deal with this. And I think the work of uh, groups like, uh, well, I won't mention any names, but I think it's been well documented, the deniers and skeptics that are organized on this issue, uh, it's unfortunate. So the second, second part of the question is, those groups, have they had much success in slowing down or, or even blocking? Well, I think, that's no well, I, think, I think that's very well documented. I think there's been some excellent books written about that recently uh, that are very well documented and um, very brave authors that have written those uh, books, and I've met them, and, and uh, I think it's very well spelled out there. Name names and who's doing what and how they do it, and it's not just the climate issue, it's a number of issues and they use the same tactics. Uh, we, we can understand, I mean, science, you know, you have to understand that science as a methodology is a skeptical process. You, you have to be a skeptic to be a scientist, to raise questions and doubts, challenge hypotheses. That's what it's all about. And community has been, I feel, uh, extremely engaged with those that question the basic science and the physics and try to target um, potential other mechanisms that might be causing that. That stuff has really been worked over. I mean, I think uh, that's why you see estimates like 95 to 99 percent of the scientific community is behind this issue, because people have looked at it from all kinds of ways of looking at it and trying to tackle it and really can't find any other way to explain what has happened or what might happen in the future. And we know how the greenhouse problem works. And we know in a laboratory how these gases absorb heat and how they re-radiate. Um, that science is known, and we know our estimate of how it might work and change in the future is pretty so is very solid. So it's, you know. I was really intrigued by what you were saying about building out engagement infrastructure to help the, the uh, practicing uh, practical agencies relate with the science agencies and, and build those bridges. Outside of uh, buying Josh a cup of coffee, which I, I highly recommend, uh, what else can HUD be doing to help build our end of that infrastructure so that we can connect up better? Well, you know, obviously I don't know the way you work, but I think more, what we find um, is uh, try to begin to engage yourselves in these various forums. The, I hope, I think you're involved in the Council of Environmental Quality uh, Adaptation Group. That's certainly a good start from the White House perspective. Uh, I think, you know, there's an open invite right now to a meeting with the Global Change Research Program in a couple of weeks. I think we've invited a number of mission agencies. You're certainly welcome to send a representative there. Uh, so tying in at the agency level. I think that's all good from a bureaucratic perspective. I think what we tried to do with Josh in our discussions with Jim Lopez, let's, we said, let's do something concrete. Let's see how this would actually work. That's what we're interested in. So I run a program office. Uh, a lot of the folks here are, are managers of various programs in that program office. And we try to engage directly with groups like yours. Can we pick a problem that we can actually work on together that you're concerned about? Uh, say, I guess you worked on Galveston and two other cities, and we try to map it out and look at the vulnerability. What do we mean by vulnerability? What does it mean to you? I mean, because we, we haven't worked together, and you know, we can tell you about the science and we can get you scared and that sort of thing, but that's not gonna be successful. We, you have to work together to understand how do you guys, how will, what does the problem mean to you and how do you work on it? And maybe, you know, for some people, this issue, my father was a harbor master, and he and I used to go out and talk about sea level change, and he said, look, you told me this is a 100-year problem. I'm concerned about Hurricane X, Y, and Z coming up the coast. <laughs> he said, I'm worried about this much sea level, not this much. And so we had a long discussion about that. So there's different, you know, there's different interest levels um, and different timings of decisions and impacts of decisions. And those that 
uh, are shorter term, are much more interested in shorter term climate change and variability. In the big El, El Nino cycle, uh, the West Coast is very concerned about that sort of thing. Uh, and some are find they're much more vulnerable to longer term issues, people that are building concrete. Uh, putting, you know, using concrete for big infrastructures, uh, the water utilities groups in the, around the country are concerned about 50 year kind of problems or longer. Like I gave you the example in New York City. So then we have to talk together about, well, what do we know about short term climate change for those that are interested in that and how can we help you with that information or climate variability? And then what do we know about the much longer for those that want to build with those, deal with those longer problems? And, um, and I think the best way at a working level is through these case studies. Try to set up partnerships, try to set up engagements, uh, set up problems like the ones Josh hopefully is working on, and um, provide uh, some very concrete examples of how this works. And then from that, I think a lot of you can learn here and, and we can learn uh, about how to work, to, uh, how, to, how to do this much better. So I hope, you know. Okay, thanks very much. Thank yeah, you very much. much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. I think we all learned a lot and got some great insight today about climate change. Um, so what I'd like to do is invite you to come. We, this is a monthly series, uh, third Thursday of every month, whatever the third Thursday happens to be. Our next session is going to be on communication and trying to understand the difference between talking and real communication. So please join us next month. And thank you again very much, Chet. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.